Okay, we're in Revelation chapter 11, going to the second part. We, we started Revelation 11 last week, but as, as, we, as I said at the beginning, and then we proved, uh, Revelation 11 is one of the more challenging chapters in the book of Revelation to interpret and understand, and no, nothing changed when we went through it. It's, I think we had a good job on it, though, because we went really deep into the Old Testament. Remember, you have to make sure you get the Old Testament stuff right, the cultural stuff right, the number stuff right, all these things to understand it best. And so um, we talked about how uh, in the chapter before, John had gotten his commission to be a prophet, and so he'd come in, and then his first action, God had, had him measure the temple, the heavenly temple, and we saw that as more of a matter of protection than it was a matter of um, of how big it was. It's more about God is measuring it to show that he's protecting it. And then as soon as that happened, the two witnesses show up, and it was really easy to see that these two are like the heirs, or they're, they hold the positions of witnesses in the in the in the same venue as Moses and Elijah. And we're talking about how the God, God has protected the church, and our job is to witness. And so now we come to verse 7 and things change. The, the, the two witnesses have been witnessing. And, and start in verse 7. It says, Now when they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. Now, we're not going to talk about the beast. Here's what John does sometimes in Revelation. He'll introduce something, and then he'll just set it off. He'll just sort of like, there it is, and he'll not even talk about it. And then later, in chapter 2, he'll really dig in. So we're not going to talk about the beast except to say, we'll do that in a few, a few weeks. Okay. So, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Remember, they had the power with their words to, to, to succumb people. It's like, picture it as like fire coming out of their mouth. But the beast is too powerful. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, and where also the, the Lord was crucified. Now, the first thing that jumps at me when I read that every time is what city are they talking about? Because it says Sodom and Egypt, and then it says where the Lord was crucified. Now, I might think, well, that has to be Jerusalem. But none of the other symbols point that way. All the symbols there and even in the following verses point to Rome. And whenever he talks about a great city throughout this book, he's talking about Rome. So how do we get that to be not Jerusalem? How do we get it to be Rome if that's where Jesus was crucified? Well, I think what they're saying is under the auspices that Rome is the, the power center and Jesus was crucified by Romans, okay? So that's why he uses that phrase. But so they're in Rome, as it were, the power center of, of their universe. And they're overpowered, they're killed, and the bodies are laying there. The bodies are dead. They're not, matter of fact, the, the Greek word is the word for dead corpses, not living living bodies. It, these are they're dead, dead. They're completely dead. Okay, and they're left on display as um, a note of power. The, the the beast and the authority have power over these two people. They they look like they had power, but the fact that we're leaving them lay dead is a we are the ones really in power. And it's a, also a reminder to anybody else. Don't you do that. That's the whole thing throughout, you know, the Roman crucifixion was that way. It was, we're going to put them up on a pole, and we're going to leave them there for a while to remind you not to mess with us, okay? So the beast and the authorities have claimed themselves very clearly. They're in control, okay? And it says, you know, in, in the the city is Rome. Now, it, it also says, compares it to Sodom. And I, we need to stop it just for a second and say, okay, what's what's that? Does that mean what I think that means? No, it doesn't. See, <laughs> um, when we think of Sodom, we tend to think Sodom and Gomorrah for one specific issue, right? But throughout the biblical tradition, um, it's also used for a lot of other things. Here's in Jeremiah 23, among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. And that's a case where they're living a lie, where, where they're living, um, committing adultery, living a lie, strengthening the hand of evildoers. They're doing bad things in a very general way. And Ezekiel 16.49 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. Here's what Sodom did wrong, ultimately. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned, they did not help the poor or the needy. So when, when God in the Bible calls a city Sodom, it's not a one specific sin. It is a, an arrogance 
toward God. It is an arrogance toward God and his principles, and it's a time of calling for judgment. Because what do you think of with Sodom? A lot of is the judgment, the fire and brimstone, the salt that rains down. You know, Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt, all that stuff. So here's what's happening is this city, Rome, which represents the center of this culture, of this power, is being called Sodom, but they're the ones who overpowered the witness. And so you're going, the two witnesses, hmm, well, the story must not be done, right? <laughs> the story must not be done if the two powerful witnesses have been left dead on the streets for three days. Well, it's in verse 9, for three and a half days. Some people from every people, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. Then it says the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. It becomes their new Christmas, because two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. And, and we need to take some time in there because there's a lot happening right there. Um, we'll not talk about the three and a half days. That number comes up a lot. We'll bring it up later. But there's two different phrases to describe the people who are walking past. The first is every people, tribe, language, and nation. And in Revelation, that list of things, sometimes it gets moved around a little bit, the people, tribe, language, and nations, they're the deceived ones. They're the ones who've fallen for the lies. Okay, But it also says the inhabitants of the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth is pulling them down to earth and they are the devious people. They're not the ones who were deceived. They're the ones who are devious. They're the ones who actively reject God. And so those groups are intermingled, and they're walking around, and they're looking at the bodies. Okay? And then something really interesting happens that you have to pay a lot of attention to to catch. After three and a half days, the breath of, the, of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. And English, any English teachers in, in the audience? Yeah. They just switched tense. I know, a lot of you don't care, but I find it really fascinating because we've been using a future tense. Okay, um, If you go back, um, verse 9, for three and a half days, some from every da-da-da will, will gaze on the bodies and will refuse them burial. They will gloat over them. They will celebrate. Okay, So it's future tense, and prophecy is often in future tense. But sometimes, not uncommonly, prophecy will be told in past tense. Past tense is even more certain. It's as if that's already been done. And right here, that shift occurs in verse 11. Suddenly it goes from future tense to past tense. After three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. So this is really certain and really intense. It's much more intense than future tense. <laughs> future tense is like, ah, oh, it's going to happen someday. Past tense is intense, okay? And then it says, the breath of life, will come in, or the, will in, breath of life enter them. Breath of life, where do we get that at? We get that from, we're back in Ezekiel again. We've been doing a lot of Ezekiel here in this chapter. If you want to understand this section, you need to understand Ezekiel, or uh, have some awareness of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel has a breath of life chapter that if you have been around the Bible much at all, you know that's, when was that? That was the Valley of Dry Bones. Ezekiel has a vision where he comes on this valley and there's nothing in the valley but dead bones. There's bones just everywhere. And then the bones begin to re... He speaks and the bones come back together and then the sinews and flesh comes on them. And then finally, God breathes or they get the breath comes on them and they come back to life. And it's that points us back to Genesis where Adam and, Adam and God breathes and he becomes a living being. So this breath... They were completely dead. This was dead dead. But instead of being behind a rock like Jesus was when it happens, this is God's breath comes in and reanimates these two. Okay? Um, and what's happening here, a couple things are happening. One is there's been a very public shaming of witnesses. There's been a very sh public shaming of believers. And now there's an incredibly public vindication of believers. You ever have that thing where you're like, boy, I wish God would show them? God showed them. Okay, God steps in and shows them very clearly. There's a public vindication. And it's not even a matter of their bodies just to send to heaven. It's a matter of they wake up, they stand up. Then they heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up in heaven in a cloud while the enemies looked on. I mean, they're sitting there and they're dead, dead, three and a half days dead. Suddenly the breath comes in. 
the picture is they stand up and then they're lifted up to heaven and there's this loud voice that accompanies it. Revelation, if you notice, is a loud book. There's lots of loud voices and loud noises and trumpets and bams and boom, and thunder and earthquakes. It's loud, okay? And not only are they vindicated, it's to a sense terrifying. Um, here's Robert Mount says this, since murder is the last resort of man, murder is the last resort of man, what can be done about those who rise from the dead? That's, that, that's the biggest, that's, that's the one, one of the many things about the crucifixion. Is Satan's biggest bullet in his gun is death. And he kills Jesus and Jesus rises from the dead, which means the biggest gun Satan has, death, is made worthless. And here it's done again, another picture with the two witnesses. And, and then as they are rising up, at that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven, notice we're still in past tense. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified. And then there's a phrase, and we're going to grab that phrase and we're going to say, how meaningful is this phrase? Because it says, 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now's the question. How much glory did they give? Remember, if, you, if, we've been, if you've been walking through this with us, the purpose of prophecy is to change the present. The purpose of all the judgment of God have been to bring people to repentance. That's what God's been wanting to do. Now, people have been rejecting repentance, and there comes the point when he, when he just flat quits trying. But the question is, when they say they gave glory to the God of heaven, does that mean a significant percentage at that final moment when the witnesses are vindicated, when they've heard the witness and the witnesses are vindicated and raised up, do they, the people watching, then give glory to God in a way that means repentance? And I never thought this before. I used to think it was just, you know, that, that just the way that like heathen cities in the Old Testament sometimes give glory to God. But there's one thing that's in there that, that makes me curious, more than one actually, but one that makes me very curious is, remember we talked about the two groups of people who come and look at the bodies. There were the people from every, the people from every, the ones from every people, tribe, language, and nation, and the inhabitants of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth are the ones who are rejecting God. But what about those people, tribe, language, and nations? Does that sound familiar to you? That group that's looking, that sees the bodies, okay? Their gaze on the bodies, not burying them. And these people see the bodies come to life, they see them ascend to heaven, they see, they hear the voice, the loud voice, they experience the earthquake. And let's go back to um, chapter 7, just a couple chapters ago, verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count. There was this, suddenly this huge multitude in heaven of believers. And it says they were from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And then it talks about them being white robes, holding branches, calling salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Are they the same bunch? Are these nation, people, language, and tribe, are they the same? Are they part of this big group? I used to think no. I used to be like no. But then I, the more I think about it, the more I think, yeah, these are, I, I, I want to say this very cautiously, we're working our way through the book, these are possibly the last people to come to, to God in the book. It's possible that they're, they do. It's possible they're last. I, I'm going to say that I believe they are people who come to God, that this whole thing with the witnesses was not in vain. God's word does not return empty that they witness for all these days and everybody's mocking them and it's not working and the, the fire from their mouth, that figurative fire from their mouth that is that fire of this prophecy of God speaking into lives, it's defeating people but it's not converting people until this final miraculous sign. And then suddenly a multitude of people turn to God. I, it makes sense because that... That's how I think of Jesus succeeding. Is Jesus succeeding if he just kills everybody? Or is Jesus succeeding if it's not everybody? 
This, I'm not saying that everybody there turns. The people who are the inhabitants of earth do not. They're rejecting God. But the people who've been deceived by all the stuff going around them, are they turning to God? And I like to think that they are. I'd like to think that's what's happening here. And I, I could be wrong, but I think there's a point to them maybe saying it. Because, I mean, Romans 2.4 is, one, is a, a great verse. It says, Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? It's not really realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So I'm thinking that at this last blast from these witnesses and they get called to heaven, that there is this little quick revival that occurs. And these people are added to the tribes and languages and all those groups that are going to be standing before the throne of God praising in this multitude no one can count. I like that form of victory. It fits with what it always bothers me the idea that Jesus wins by losing. He wins by killing everybody. No, I think he wins by converting people. That's how Jesus counts wins. And and kind of to support that, a couple, th a couple things. One is a little tidbit thing. There's an earthquake in the largest city on earth, the most powerful city on earth, and it destroys a tenth of the city. A tenth of the city collapses. And then it says 7,000 people were killed. That doesn't seem like that many. I mean, in this book, the numbers are huge and extreme. And if a tenth of the largest city, which is going to be measured in the millions of people, if, if there are two million people in Rome when this occurs, if a tenth of the city is, killed, is destroyed, you would think a tenth and a tenth of seven million is 700,000, not 7,000. 7,000 is getting off easy. Unless... It's intended as a witness. Well, there's other, other reasons it could be, but it supports my contention that this is people turning to God. And also supporting is it what happens next. Because this chapter is so complicated. I was planning on breaking here. I was going to last week, I was going to try to get all the way through 13 or 14 and then do the next part. Last. But when I've had to do it this way, it changes the way that I view verses 14 through 19. Because now... With these people, if they've taken out, if it's glorification. Because what happens next, let's let's just move into that. The, the next thing that happens is the second woe is past, the third woe is coming. Uh-oh, woes are coming. And then it says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven. Now, what are you expecting? Chances are you haven't read this today, have you? I'm Not a problem. You came to, her, to learn about it. You probably haven't read it. What's going to happen when the seventh trumpet blasts? Oh gosh, it's going to be terrible! It's going. To, we've saw what the first six were, and they were. It was. It was calamitous. It was started out with natural disasters, then it moved to supernatural disasters. That when the seal seventh seal was broken, what happens is seven trumpets emerge, and it goes crazy that way. But listen to this: the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, which said, "Are you ready?" The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Instead of concluding the seventh trumpet with more destruction, we get a coronation. And if Jesus, and you can go either way, if, if the final part of, this works whether, however you interpret that last phrase of the other verse, whether this victory is coming through pure destruction or whether it's coming through destruction and repentance and adding people to the kingdom, at the end of this, Jesus is crowned king. This is the coronation. It's been announced that he's going to be king. Now he becomes king. The seventh trumpet isn't about judgment. It's about coronation. And that's important because here's uh, G.B. Caird said this. In one sense, God's sovereignty is eternal. God's always been in control. But up to this point, he's reigned over a rebellious world. He reigns over a rebellious world right now. Right? A king may be king by right, de jure, but he is not king de facto, in fact, until the trumpet which announces his ascension is answered by the acclamations of a loyal and obedient people. And the seventh trumpet is not a trumpet of judgment. It's the trumpet announcing the king has been crowned. 
And that's what happens next is the people rejoice in verse 16. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was. Now, we'll stop right there because that's interesting. The one who is and who was and what follows that every time up to here in Revelation. The one who was and who is and what? And who is to come. They left it off. Now that's in chapter 1, verse 4. It's in chapter 1, verse 8. It's in chapter 4, verse 8. It always says, and is to come. Why does it not say, and is to come? Because he's already there. He has arrived. The, the, the motorcade has brought him to the capital. He is in control. There is no reason to say he is the one who is to come because he's already here. So he is the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for for judging the dead. Let me just let me stop there. Let's stop. I'm trying to figure out how, to, how much to read and how much to break in. Okay, it wasn't it's come because you have taken your great power and have begun to, begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. Now that's interesting, because the word anger and the word wrath come from the same root word. In other words, it's a play on words. Um, the message t translates that. The angry nations now get a taste of your anger. And that gets it, but it misses a piece of it because in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, you'll see God get ticked off. In the New Testament, God doesn't get ticked off. He's, he doesn't get angry that way. He gives people what their actions deserve. What, what, what they, get, they get their comeuppance, okay? In other words, they reap what they sow. And this is what's saying. You have sown anger, you're now reaping God's judgment, okay? So, okay, so now, when it, you, you've taken great power, gun rain, your nations are angry, your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead. The time has come for judging the dead. And then he's going to break it down into two groups. For judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small. So rewarding those who are the prophets and those who've revered God's name, both great and small. Great and small means everybody on both extremes and everybody in the middle who has revered God's name and for destroying those who destroy the earth so God's judging he's taking he's rewarding the the faithful followers of God and he's destroying the destroyers um, and interesting sorry this is Greek as your English class for the day you know how we talked about earlier how it had switched from future tense to present tense it now switches, and this is something you didn't study in English because English doesn't have this specifically. It switches from present tense to what the Greeks, we call in Greek, the aorist tense. And the present tense means, in a sense, something is happening. Okay? That's present. Um, past tense means it happened. Aorist means it happened. Okay? I'm, what's, a, what's a good... Um, the, the tree blossomed. Well, the tree is still blossoming. It's continuing action. Aorist means it's done. The bomb done blowed up. Okay? When the bomb blew up, that's aorist. Okay? That's happened. It is done. And it switches to that here for almost all of these words. Almost all these words that are verbs are in the aorist, it is finished sense. Okay? Um, and we've got the dualism. Okay? This, and then the, the last piece I want to hit on out of that part, we've got the dualism, the heiress, the de heiress is very decisive. These are decisive actions by God. And then let's, let's, let's spend some time on and kind of almost finish up with that destroying those who destroy the earth. That points us to a, a mistake we make a lot of times. Because one of the things we think of is we think of creation from a purely human perspective. Just about people. Everything God's doing is just about people. But God is restoring his creation. Okay, um, there was earlier there was a talk about a rainbow over the throne. We saw that a couple chapters ago, or one chapter ago, and the rainbow points us back to where Noah. Okay, and Noah, you may think the rainbow is saying God's not going to ever destroy all the human race by flood. That's what it means, right? God's never going to destroy all the people on earth because of flood. The only problem is that's not accurate. That's not what it says. It says in Genesis 9, 16, Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. 
Okay? The flood didn't just destroy humans, it destroyed all living creatures. And the rainbow says, I'm never going to destroy not just humans, all creatures. God is restoring his creation. God's purpose in his world, this is Ian Paul, God's purpose in the world is its redemption and renewal. I am making everything new and not its destruction. I am making all th everything new, all things new. Okay? Not, he's restoring creation completely. God is the creator of the whole world, this is Tom Wright. And his entire purpose is to reclaim that whole world as his own and set it the way to become the place he intended it to be. God's purpose is not just to get people to heaven. Matter of fact, that's not his purpose at all. I hate to break it to you. God's purpose is not to get people to heaven. God's people, God's purpose is to get heaven to earth where the people are. We'll see this in Revelation 21. And if most of you know this, you just hadn't thought about it. Heaven descends to earth. And earth becomes what God's always intended it to be. Okay? Are there animals in heaven? It sure looks like it because he says he's never going to destroy all the animals again. Okay? So, and then the, the last verse. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and his temple was, was seen, and in his temple, within his temple, was seen the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was always closed on earth. You couldn't see it. Nobody could see it. Now it's open in heaven, and we can all go there. And the Ark of the Covenant, just to complete this whole picture of what's going on here, the Ark of the Covenant is a throne. It's the throne where God resides, where God sits. In, in the Old Testament, God sits on the throne, but only one dude's allowed to go in like once a year. Now the door is open, and all of us can see that God, the one who we just crowned, Okay, we crowned it. You know, he gets crowned. The seventh trumpet announces, da, da, da. he's been crowned. He comes in. There's the multitudes. There's the praise. There's the judgment as he sits on his throne and he is in total control. Okay, and then the final thing it says, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. And that comes up repeatedly throughout Revelation to say God's working and to remind us of. I think a lot of it, to go back to Exodus chapter 20 in that area where we get the Ten Commandments and God is announcing it. Um, one thing, I, I want to close this one, is we, we actually read, I read this last week too. There's a psalm that as you read this entire chapter that just keeps popping out. And, and it's in individual phrases, it's in concepts, it's in everything. Because we started out, we had this, the two witnesses show up, okay? And they're proclaiming God's truth to the people, and they're rejecting, and the powers of earth are fighting and beating them down. And then the beast shows up, and the beast kills them. But then they rise, and God is crowned king. Jesus is crowned king of all creation. And let's go back and read Psalm 2 one more time. Why do the nations conspire? <laughs> See? Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger. He terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. Every nation, tribe, people, okay, your inheritance. And the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. He actually quoted that line in, the, in this chapter. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son of her. He will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. Destroy the destroyers. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. What more is there to say except to make a quick announcement? Um, as many of you know, every summer I take four week, four or five weeks off to, to recharge the batteries. And so starting next Monday, I'll be going on three weeks of vacation, then a week, one week of, of st a study week to try to get myself in position to, to preach and teach uh, for the rest of the year. So this is the last one of these for the next month, um, next four, uh, four consecutive weeks. Um, it's also, uh, there won't be any jump starts for the next time, so if you're, if you're used to that, uh, you can go to YouTube. There's years worth of <laughs> backlog. You can find one for each day. And um, if you're on Facebook and you like my 
inspiring thoughts of the day, they're taking a vacation as well. So anyway, starting next Monday. Anyway, you guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you later. All right, bye.